Today we're here to talk to you a little bit about, uh, in about 12 minutes, uh, a project that we did uh, called the Access App. Um, Nancy Proctor and I were two particip participants in this project, but there was a, a wide range of uh, partners uh, in, in the project uh, over a three-year period. Um, I pulled this quote from our IMLS grant application that I think um, kind of sums up why we did this project for one. Um, and of course, it was most importantly to make museums more accessible to uh, blind and low vision uh, visitors. But also, this quote served really well, I think, in retrospect, looking back at it, as a great starting point to get approval within our uh, organizations uh, from our leadership to, to participate in this, in this project. A museum that's not con content, content accessible is failing in its mission with some of its visitors, not position that any museum really wants to be in. And then after reading that, I decided to take a step back even further uh, to maybe four years ago when um, Nancy uh, and Halsey Burgund, who we'll, I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, were sitting in Washington and came up with the idea uh, for this project. American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And this is the kind of structure that we're aiming to produce with our work on the Apps Access app platform. And the aim of this project is to create a platform and tools for museums to build apps that increase accessibility to their collections and their conversations and their communities. And uh, to do so both for people with disabilities, um, so crowdsourcing verbal descriptions of collection objects, multilingual content, video of sign language content, but also access in the sense of universal design, um, giving people access to the content they want in the way that they want it, in the media, and the form, and the kind of tone that they want. I'm Nancy Proctor. I head up mobile strategy and initiatives at the Smithsonian. And I'm Halsey Burgund. I'm a sound artist. and. Uh, I've been working with Nancy for a couple of years now on various audio-related projects. So we started well over a year ago mm, using yeah. Roundware, which you developed for a number of your artworks, your audio installation artworks, participatory artworks, um, to crowdsource geolocated audio from the public. So one of the reasons I, I choose this video is Halsey and Nancy are two of my people two of my favorite people in the museum community. Uh, and Halsey can't be here, so I, I, Halsey is, is part of the real genesis of this project. And I thought it was really beautiful in a way that an artist who developed a platform then turned into uh, the beginnings of this platform for the Access app. Uh, so what happened shortly after that is um, Nancy reached out to uh, my colleague at the Peabody Essex mm -hmm. Museum Juliet Frisch, who was principal investigator for the project, and they did a um, national leadership grant proposal to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and uh, we got a three-year grant uh, to uh, to collaborate with a, a, a wide range of partners on the project. So um, I will say that this project probably had more staff turnover than any project I have ever worked on, um, uh, but we chose the institutions for very specific reasons. Uh, we wanted to have a wide range of museums, so Indianapolis Museum of Art uh, as kind of a more traditional art museum with also with a, with, a, with a campus. Smithsonian, of course, uh, wide-ranging uh, uh, institutions there. Plymouth Plantation, which is a living history museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, the Museum of Science, to make sure we had a science museum. The Shedd Aquarium was in the project for a short period of time and, and had to withdraw. And the Kennedy Center, which is a cultural performance center, uh, was also important for us to, to bring uh, them to the table. <clears throat> we had a wide range of expertise, and we really did think of it as a dream team when we started the project. Halsey, of course, if you're not familiar with any of his works, uh, if you go back and look at Scapes, which is a project he did for the Decor of a Museum, which is kind of the start of this platform, and has go on, gone on to have many iterations uh, within other museums. Uh, Nancy, uh, both executive director of Muse, Muse Web Foundation and uh, currently uh, at the Peel Center for Baltimore uh, History and Architecture. Kyle uh, Jebker, which is um, kind of interesting, it, this is a whole other conference session, is someone who's left the museum field to, to go to, to, to private industry, but Kyle was uh, one, of the, one of the founders of the IMA, IMA lab 
and uh, worked on uh, Toramel and TAP, two of the things that we hope would be foundations for whatever direction we took um, the Access app. And Sina Bahram, who many of you know, and if you don't know him, you should seek him out at this conference and introduce yourself, who's a computer scientist and accessibility expert with Prime Access Consulting. So our key research question was this, how can museums and cultural centers provide equal access to their content and collections in the format and through the means that each individual prefers. And that idea of having choice and being universally designed, having accessibility was, was important for us. So our goals, among many, um, were to, that collaboration was essential uh, for this project to, to succeed. Our partners um, <coughs> contributed to the grant proposal and they really talked through what their needs and desires would be uh, for each individual institution and for their audiences. We knew it had to be an open source solution. Uh, we needed to develop it in alignment with the universal de design principles, as I've mentioned. We also uh, wanted to make a toolkit uh, for cultural organizations that they could customize. And the customization was from the code to the content development to the actual marketing of the product in the end. We wanted to give them kind of a soup to nuts opportunity to, uh, to, to learn our best practices from this, from this project. And again, the thought that making it accessible would make it accessible to everyone. So some of the challenges we faced is I think one of the presumptions we made early on is that geolocation in the three years over the course of the grant would, would be in a better place than it, than it currently is. And we, we didn't find that magic bullet um, solution to actually pinpointing where you are in a space. And that was very important to us for the, for the blind community, not to be at this speaker or at that water pitcher or somewhere in between. We wanted to put you at the space where the object, where the object was. So we worked with, with Apple. We did with uh, Indoor Maps. They mapped our entire uh, museum. Um, and that was all built into the app, which was done in iOS, because we've, we've learned through, through uh, conversations with, with the blind and low vision community that um, a majority of, of folks are using uh, iOS devices because of the built-in accessibility um, uh, features in each of those. We also did a collaboration with the Perkins School for the Blind uh, early on in the project, and then later we did some testing with them. It was really cool, as I had, didn't realize that these, these things exist, but to make raised drawings with these little sketch pads to uh, kind of play around with your user interface design and then let um, visitors touch those to get a sense of, uh, a, a tactile sense of what uh, this might feel like when they're actually uh, using it through a screen reader. This isn't uh, the actual final product. This is one of our MVPs, one of our prototypes that we use to test in the museum. Um, the idea was we, it could be used across many institutions. The, you do make one download and then use the app at, at different <coughs> places. Uh, it had two very basic functions. The idea was that you could listen to a stream of, of content that was delivered from both the institution and user generated, but you could also contribute. And one of our goals was to to really find good ways of getting question prompts to develop uh, solid user-generated uh, content. And quickly, just to give you a sense, a little more about visual description, um, these are just some definitions that, that will give you some idea of, as to what we're, we're talking about here. But the basics are just basically communicating visual information to the blind uh, and those with, with low vision. I have a couple of samples here of some of the tests uh, Horse paths with people standing around in their fancy clothes and uh, walking as, with families, as well as uh, small, um, are they phaeton, uh, two-wheeled carts. Uh, kind of interesting. There's all sorts of things going on. It looks like a militia uh, ex exercise in the middle of the park. It's very formal, very... Um, kind of naive, uh, not realistic, but it gives you a, a feeling of space, all crammed into a fairly small canvas. And here's one more. This one's one of my favorites. It's humorous, I think, uh, to some degree. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. This one is a gold-like looking statue with a lot of cherubs on there that look like they're holding knives mm -hmm. or quills. They're holding quills. Sorry, they look like knives. Um, it reminds me of something that you would see like on the Titanic is what I would think. Um, lots of florals, lots of berries, very heavenly hmm. to me. 
um, and incredibly ornate. So much detail that you can't even really describe, and they don't really seem like they would go together, but they do. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about this description that I find interesting, and it's not to, 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 to single out this individual, but she never says it's a chandelier. You know, she says it's a sculpture. It's, it's some, you have, there's some problems sometimes with, with just asking you know, people who are not trained in, in visual description to, to try to do that. Um, and she starts second guessing herself, which is fine. It's actually great that she starts to look and think at the same time, saying, oh, those aren't knives, those, those are quills. So that's an interesting example. We also, uh, after having done those tests with sighted people, brought in some, uh, some visitors in the in local Salem area who, who were blind and low vision to, um, to test out the end product. Play to play the, the audio experience that we have for this oil painting. So this is at, in the Peabody Essex Museum Galleries. We brought the community in and just used a speaker to have them uh, listen rather than actually using one of the devices. So from here, I think I'll hand it over to Nancy to talk a little bit more about um, what we learned, evaluation, best practices, and how we hope to bring the project forward. Sure. So I think um, something that we sort of suspected at the outset, and this was part of writing the whole kind of grant proposal for the project, was that every institution was going to have its own existing infrastructure that it wanted to make more accessible. So the approach from a technology point of view was how can you build um, the, the crowdsourcing of be it visual descriptions or sign language content as kind of modules or, or um, tools that could be plugged into whatever a museum already has or is already using. Um, and that, you know, as you can imagine, has a certain kind of technical challenge, but despite that kind of being a pretty high bar, how do you build universally re reusable tools? I think really the biggest challenge that this project has faced and con will continue to face for some time is, um, as Jim was saying, this, this question of quality of the content. Because you are looking at crowdsourcing content rather than having so-called um, experts develop it. And um, one of the key things that came out of our very first prototype, which was for the, um, uh, the Smithsonian American uh, Museum of American History in an exhibition that we had there, was that really the people who participate in doing the verbal describing are as much the target audience as the people who might be blind or have low vision who would then use those, that content. So as Jim was saying in that last sample, of the chandelier, the person who's describing the artwork is really going through a close looking exercise and, um, and thinking about it and engaging on a deeper level. And they're not just engaging with that object, but in essence, they're engaging with the whole institution. So they are saying, you know, I'm investing in helping this institution create its, its collections, content, and interpretive experience, and therefore I'm kind of part of the team. And so that was a really kind of an important thing to take away. Um, I, so uh, earlier this year, I uh, came to um, pick up a third job, which was just what I needed to go with my three kids. Um, uh, heading up a startup museum in Baltimore. It's actually based in the very first museum building um, that was ever built in this country, uh, the Peel Museum from 1814. Um, and it's, uh, we're, we're essentially renovating the building and relaunching as a, as a center for Baltimore history and architecture. The building has been mainly empty for 20 years and has a lot of water damage. It really needs renovation, but we're able to use it um, even though it really is not technically um, accessible. We don't have an elevator, for example, but we're using it as much as we can and trying to kind of 
bootstrap some, some accessibility where possible. So we hosted an, an exhibition recently called Birdland and the Anthropocene, um, which occupied the, all four floors of the building. It's sort of a federal style uh, townhouse with a picture gallery built on the back. And um, we wanted to, so the, the curator of this exhibition considers herself disabled. Um, she did a lot of work with a group of um, artists with disabilities in the community who also were part of the exhibition, exhibited their work. Um, and we wanted to use the, the kind of the toolkit um, from the, the Access App project to try to make the exhibition as accessible as possible. Um, so in this case, the tools were built into, um, again, another app, so not the Peabody Essex app, um, but one called um, uh, Be Here Stories, which it's an iOS app. You can download it for free from the App Store and you can listen to some of this content. Um, and so it is a roundware-based app. And to get the visual descriptions of this exhibition, we partnered with uh, a group of students from MICA, the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art in Baltimore, who were on the curatorial practice program. So these are students who've come from exhibition design or art history. I mean, they know what ekphrasis is, right? They've, they've had to describe objects before. And they came in uh, the morning of the opening of the show and just kind of blitz described as much as they could. Um, some of the students were Chinese speaking uh, natives and so they did describing in Chinese and this was really just a kind of a, an attempt to test and see well what happens if you use this basic platform not just for accessibility um, for people who might be blind and have low vision but also for accessibility of people um, who speak other languages and I would say that you know really what we uh, kind of came away with was the greatest benefit was was for the participants doing the describing. Um, the, we're still in a historical moment where people who are blind or are partially sighted, and this goes as well for people who are uh, sign language users, for example, are so used to not being served in museums, it doesn't occur to them to come. So the, you know, the actual audience who are going to rock up and use these visual descriptions are very small. And I experienced this as well when I built um, for Tate Modern, their first British Sign Language guide. This was back in 2002, so before smartphones even, that you know, people who were deaf just didn't come to the museum because they didn't think there was going to be anything there for them. So the, um, the kind of, some of the key takeaways were that really the, to get content you have to create events where you have target audiences coming in to describe and those target audiences are probably going to be people who aren't just, you know, anyone random off the street. They've got some investment in the material already. So in our early prototypes at uh, the American History Museum, it was actually docents who did a lot of the describing. Or in our case, uh, with the Birdland exhibition, it was really the, the students who are part of the curatorial practice program. Um, so they already have a certain familiarity with the visitor experience and how to talk about artworks for visitors. Um, and I think that's a really kind of important thing to take back to these conversations, which say, why would you let rank amateurs produce museum content? Um, you know, can there be any value that actually, because you're talking about a self-selecting audience, you're going to get somebody who already has some sort of an affinity, and that maybe at least half of your project, therefore, is serving them, um, and they may already be kind of in one of the many rings of your, your kind of inner circle of audiences. Um, and I think that's kind of the, we're probably I'm running out of town now, aren't we? Yeah, time now. So, um, mm -hmm. shall I hand back over to you for well, this final? Well, I think we can finish it up just yeah, by okay. saying that if you go to the yeah. website, theaccessapp.org, you can find all of the code, <coughs> all of the evaluations that we've done, all of the learnings, there's papers, there's research, there's a lot of information there that if you're interested in doing your own project with uh, the base level stuff that we did for the Access App, you can go in and, and reach out to us, read all that material, and it's a good starting point. And there's also a community of practice on accessibility that um, grew out of the last Museums in the Web conference. Um, and there's a wiki where kind of materials and conversations are being gathered, um, which we very unhelpfully didn't put the URL in for, but <laughs> we can shoot that around as well. Um, it's on, it'll be, it's linked to from the Access app from the website. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, I know we're running late and we're running up against lunch. 
let's take a few quick questions. Doug? Uh, yeah. You mentioned ASL. feels a bit harder to crowdsource that. Mm. What, what's happening? Uh, does the app play video? And yeah, so the uh, great question. Thanks for asking that. The Roundware platform does support video. Um, but what we haven't done yet is had a, essentially a project with a budget to develop the interface because as you can imagine playback of video is very different from just playback of audio. Um, but the basic core technical ability is there and yes that idea was very much that um, you could have a, a visit with an ASL user where they're recording themselves describing the exactly yeah yeah. Um, but that is part of the project that this, the, the Access App project, didn't have the scope to include. Any other questions? And Mark and Jason have some uh, uh, tablets here if you want to get a demo of what's going on at the Getty. If we're finished, I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, thank our panelists. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>